In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. St. John of the Cross tells us that in the evening of life, we will be judged on how much we have loved. Now this is the most important thing that we need to know. That when we appear before God on the last day, He will not ask us if we fasted every day. He won't ask us if we've spent our entire lives in penance or if we have given hours and hours to prayer. But what we will be judged on is how much we have loved. Now, it's not that these others aren't important, but they must be accompanied with love. St. Paul tells us that love is the fulfillment of the law. But all this talk about love, what does it mean? What's the meaning of love? Well, the world definitely doesn't get it right. The world sees love as a work of the flesh, while the saints see love as a work of the spirit, something supernatural. On the first day of the mission, Father Wolf clearly showed that we can't feel sanctifying grace because it is something supernatural. He said, because it is something supernatural, or because it is supernatural, we can't sense it in any way. We can't feel it, smell it, taste it, touch it, hear it, see it. Well, true love is also supernatural. I say true love because true love is love of God. It's supernatural charity. That's the meaning of it. Now, if we truly love God, we will be able to love men properly because we have things in the right order. God first and men for the sake of God. Love isn't something material. It isn't an act of the flesh. It is independent entirely of our emotions and our feelings. Now, what I mean by that is love is not a feeling. It's not an emotion. No matter what this music, all these rock songs are telling you, that's not what it is. In fact, St. Alphonsus defines it. He says that love of God is a divinely infused virtue which leads us to love the Lord our God as the sovereign good and purely for his own sake. All perfection consists in the love of God. Now, the most common error we suffer today is that we think that when we talk about love, we think we are talking about the feelings and the emotions. Now, why is that a problem? Because if it is about how we feel and about our emotions, then the logical conclusion of all this is if it feels good, do it. This isn't love. This is selfishness. Or we could conclude also, if it feels bad, don't do it. In other words, if something causes me difficulty, sorrow, or suffering, where I don't feel good, then I'm out of here. I have no responsibilities, and I'm gone. And this is definitely not love. This is childish immaturity, which has absolutely no place in heaven. So for most people, love really isn't love. It doesn't involve sacrifice. Their idea of love doesn't include suffering. The world's idea of love doesn't mean selflessness or self-denial, but self. To most people, love means only one thing, me. That's all that love is about. I love me. And however anyone fits into my little world to please me and to make me feel good or self-fulfilled or self-satisfied, then it is an indication of whether or not I love another person. It's how they make me feel. In other words, love is all about me. It's all about my self-affirmation and my self-empowerment. This is ridiculous. And this is the rebellious or the rebellion against God it comes that uh, the proceed the feminist movement comes from this abortion contraception other perversions all come from this because it's all about me now some may think if i feel good about others maybe if i'm in a good mood then it means that i love well this too is nonsense because it's self-serving but this is where we are today the media The TV, the Internet, is filled with all this garbage. It's all from hell. There was a billboard that I once saw in Canada. And it was a thing, it was an advertise on chocolate. And it says, never, never, never deny pleasure. That's a principle. 
That's a worldly principle. Now, all of this revolves around pride, self-love, egoism, self-fulfillment, self-expression is the word's advice to lead us to happiness. But this only entrenches us further into ourselves. And that's why pornography is such a major industry, because it feeds the self. It feeds that fallen love that, this, that wants to please itself, that wants to please me. It is a perpetual, selfish cycle that we can't get rid of, and this is hell. There's no love for anyone but self. This is hell. The definition of hell is the absence of the presence of God. So guess what? If I love myself, there's no room for God. This is hell. And if we live like this, then we're living hell. But the world and the devil are selling this. And we're buying it. That's the problem. Now, on Monday, we looked at two types of behaviors, the works of the flesh and the works of the spirit. Now, if we think that love is defined by the works of the flesh, that is, by pleasure, by my emotions, and by my feelings, then we are led by the fallen human spirit or the demonic spirit. But if love is defined by the works of the spirit, then we're led by the Holy Spirit. This is how we are to overcome the world. Our Lord said, I came that they may have life and they might have it to the fullest. God wants us to have life to the fullest. So he came to bring us his spirit. He came to bring us himself. And this is how we are going to survive this great apostasy in the church and the serious moral crisis in the world. It's the only way. Love of God and not love of self. So we have to get serious because we're getting into a serious time now. Now, eternal happiness rests in God alone. The world doesn't sell this. In fact, St. Augustine tells us, Our hearts are made for Thee, O Lord, and they are restless until they rest in Thee. We're in a fight for our souls. The world wants our soul. The devil wants our soul. But God created this beautiful thing called a soul that we have for us to gain eternal salvation. And the devil, with his anger, with his jealousy, his envy, wants to take that soul from us and bring it to hell with him. And so we are in a fight for our soul. And the world is not a friendly place for this fight. Now the works of the flesh, the world, the devil, and our fallen human nature are our enemies. But God, our Blessed Mother, the saints, the angels, they are our friends and they love us and they want us to go after the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And this is what they're here to help us do. They want us to become saints. Do we? Do we want to become saints? Are we willing to ask for their help? Salvation is easy. But we need to work and pray. Now, there are clearly two kingdoms, the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of heaven. In fact, St. Augustine talks about this in the city of God, and he says the following. He says, he says, though there are very many nations all over the earth, there are no more than two kinds in human society, which, we call, which you may justly call two cities, one, of, one consisting of those who live according to man, and the other of those who live according to God. To the city of man belong the enemies of God, so inflamed with hatred against the city of God. Two loves have produced two cities. One in which the love of God unites all men, and a second where all citizens, regardless of time and place, are united by the love of the world. The first, love of God, to the point of self-contempt. Or the second, love of self, carried to the contempt of God, love of flesh or love of the spirit. In any case, they're distinguished by love. Love is the root. Now we all seek God and we all seek love. But Proverbs tell us one thing, 
God is love. A very easy equation. God is love. So how we answer the following question will indicate what kingdom we want to serve. The city of the world or the city of God? So here's the question. Which one truly knows how to love? The devil, the world, fallen human nature? Who truly knows how to love? Who truly knows how to love? No greater love does any man have than to give his life for his friends. No greater love does any man have than to give his life for his friends. Who truly knows how to love? Who truly knows how to love? This image of our Lord crucified renders all definitions of love wordless. They're completely useless when we look at the definition of love by our Lord's sacrifice. This is love. And this is how we will be victorious in the coming persecution. This is how we will survive, through love. But it begins with love of God. So I'll go through some practical steps to help us to increase in love of God, because this is the way to holiness. Now, St. Alphonsus tells us that all perfections consist in the love of God. For love is the virtue which unites us most intimately with God. All other virtues are of no account unless they are accompanied by love. Love is necessary for salvation. And God gives us his command in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy. He says, Thou shalt love the Lord your God with your whole heart. Why does God say heart? Is he talking about love of the flesh? No, our Lord is talking about supernatural life. But God draws this example of the heart for a purpose. Now we view the heart through imagery, of course, as the interior source of love. This is why on St. Valentine's Day you receive valentines that have hearts on them, or you receive a box of chocolates in the shape of a heart, and so on. But it's because the heart is a symbol, a sign of love. We attribute to the heart the most tender sentiments of the soul. This is why Christ took on human flesh. So he could have this heart for us to see and to love and to adore. Our Lord appeared to St. Matilda, and she gave this account of the revelation that she received. She said, One day I saw the Son of God holding in his hands his own heart, which appeared more brilliant than the sun, and which was casting rays of light on every sign. Then this amiable Savior gave to me to understand that the graces of God unceasingly pours forth on men according to the capacity of each, they come from the plenitude of his divine heart. The graces of God come forth from his divine heart. This is why God has given us a devotion to his most sacred heart. And he has not given us just his heart, but he's given us his entire self. When one of the Pharisees asked our Lord, he said, Master, which is the greatest commandment of the law? Our Lord answered, and he said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart and with thy whole soul and with thy whole mind and your neighbor as yourself. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart, with thy whole soul, with thy whole mind, and thy neighbor is thyself. Now the Lord is God, and he says, Thou shalt love thy God. He's speaking about himself as well, because God loves himself perfectly. Everything that our Lord commands, he too fulfills in perfect justice and love. But then our Lord says, Love your neighbor as yourself. So if our Lord loves his neighbor as himself, And he's God. Does that mean that he loves us as he loves God? 
Now, of course, you think, well, that's pretty crazy, Father. Does our Lord love us the same way he loves God? I know this sounds unbelievable. So I'll quote St. Alphonsus, who quotes another saint and doctor of the church, St. Thomas. And he says, the love which consumes the heart of God makes it appear as though in man he saw his God and that he could not be happy unless man were happy too. God loves us. God loves us. The Holy Spirit in the book of Proverbs says, Son, give me thy heart. God wants us to give him our hearts. Why is this? Because he has already given us his. He loves us. So fostering a devotion to the sacred heart of Jesus puts us into contact with him. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for contact with God. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, we have to cut away all the obstacles to this devotion. Anything that gets in the way of our love for God. And so I'll go through those. In fact, there's a, there's a priest, uh, Father Crossett, who writes a book on true devotion to the sacred heart of Jesus. And he outlines four obstacles that keep us from devotion to the sacred heart of Jesus. And so I'll go through with them. The first obstacle is stupidity or lukewarmness. Now, a lukewarm or tepid soul is a soul that is not burning for the love of Christ. This soul is weak and has no love and no fire of love for anything, good or bad. It is a soul that is totally apathetic, that cares little about the spiritual life, or has become spiritually lazy. Our Lord said, I would that thou art hot or cold, but because thou art lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. That's what our Lord thinks about lukewarmness. Lukewarmness is when we don't care, when we just go through the motions, thinking that we're okay, just putting the check in the box and going on. So how do we know we're lukewarm? We say prayers without attention. We go to confession without a firm purpose of amendment. Or we don't go to confession often. We put it off for a month, three months, a whole year. We shouldn't go longer than two weeks. And I'll talk more of that tomorrow. Another way to go to grow lukewarm is we go to Holy Communion without fervor or proper preparation. And so they become fruitless. Now we'll take an aside here. Mother Teresa of Calcutta was once asked, what is the greatest abomination you've seen? And you figured her working in India, she's seen all kinds of things. Every sickness, every disease, AIDS, you name it, she's seen it. What's the greatest abomination or what's the, great, what's the, what's the worst thing you've ever seen? She said, communion in the hand. Communion in the hand. The worst thing she's ever seen. This is God. Communion in the hand. Because it takes away from the divinity of Christ when all of a sudden he's something that anybody can get a hold of with their hands. We start to lose that reverence. We start to lose that respect of Almighty God. We start to mistreat him. He becomes an object of sacrilege. It becomes an object of occult practices. This is what happens with communion in the hand. That's why Mother Teresa of Calcutta said this. It's the worst thing that she has ever seen. That is her God and she loves him so much. This is the worst abomination. Now we go to Holy Communion without fervor or proper preparation. The other sign of lukewarmness is we become lazy in acquiring the virtues proper to our state. We begin to have a disgust for spiritual things, and the exercises of devotion and piety become a burden, and the practice of virtue seems almost impossible. Then we get into our comfort zone. We don't want to bother others, or we don't want to be bothered with others. Other people become a pressing issue on us, so we lose charity and we become lukewarm. Sermons on the spiritual life start to become uncomfortable and even annoy us to the point of questioning the messenger and even questioning divine truth. A tepid soul has no fire for our Lord, and so this soul is in a state of blindness. 
This blindness causes us to remain in our venial sins for many, many years because we don't have the courage of the will to fight them. And so we begin to excuse our faults. This is stupidity or lukewarmness, and it leads to self-love. And so we come to our second obstacle, self-love. Now, self-love is the most powerful the most powerful motive not to love God. And it puts on a hundred reasons why it shouldn't strive for holiness. We make up all kinds of excuses why we don't make that commitment that we want to make. We make those excuses of why we're not holding up our sacrifices during Lent. Okay, I can do this this once, you know, it's no big deal. I'll get back on my sacrifices tomorrow. We make up excuses. We do what we want to. Often we try to serve ourselves and God at the same time. Now, why is this a problem? Why why serving God and ourselves at the same time? How can that be a problem? Well, because we can only commit ourselves really to one, either to God or ourselves. We can't serve two masters. Our Lord told us that. Because we'll begin to neglect one. Our Lord said you can't serve two masters. He said this because we fall into a situation where it becomes easier to please ourselves. That's just our fallen human nature. So when we're trying to do both, we end up pleasing ourselves, and we end up avoiding doing the things that give honor and glory to God. We lose that edge of holiness and that desire to become saints. We can't serve two masters. Now, the third obstacle for obtaining devotion to the sacred heart of Jesus, is a hidden pride. Now, a hidden pride, it doesn't mean we go around and say, hey, I'm the coolest guy out there. But what what a hidden pride is, is we do things to be seen by others. Even humility itself can be a source of pride. if we do. Oh, I want want to make sure everybody sees me as humble. We do things to be seen by others so that others may think well of us, rather than doing things for the honor and glory of God. It's very simple. We put a supernatural object in front of us to take away that hidden pride. But that hidden pride, we know we have it if we begin to look at just the faults in others. We're always looking at the faults of others. We start criticizing. And we never look at their good qualities. That's a sign that we have hidden pride. Another sign that we have hidden pride is we're always looking at the good in ourselves as having come from us. In other words, oh, if I do something good, it's because of me. And I must have that just of myself, because I'm me. No, it's because God gave you that gift. That's why we can do these things. Because God loves us and he created us that way. Now, if we think of Palm Sunday, how many would think of it as ridiculous if the donkey went around saying, hey, that's me, as our Lord is riding on his back, coming into Jerusalem. Hey, I'm cool. It's not about the donkey. Our Lord is riding on him. It's the glory to God. He is serving a purpose. He is an instrument for the glory of God. But if the donkey were to take it all on himself, it's because of me that everybody's showing this glory. This is great. That's a sign of hidden pride. The last obstacle to to, uh, true devotion to the sacred heart of Jesus is that we still suffer from an unmortified passion, something that we're attached to, something that we love that we can't break with. Now, we heard about this yesterday in yesterday's talk. We're seeing John of the Cross spoke about being tied to a limb. We're either tied by a chain or tied by a string, but either way, we're tied. It doesn't matter if it's a hard chain or a thin chain small cord. Both keep us tied down. The same thing if we have an unmortified passion. Something that we know pleases us. Something that's very, very difficult for us to do the right thing. So in other words, if a child is being called by his mother to do something, now he's playing his favorite game. He doesn't want to get up to do it. Well, this shows that there's a certain unmortified passion towards this game that he's playing because he's avoiding doing the things that are necessary. 
And that's how we can tell we have an unmortified passion. And that's how we can be specific about it, too. What is keeping me from doing the things that please God, doing my duties, and doing my vocation? Those things that keep me from doing that, that is my unmortified passion. That's the something that I have to work on. An unmortified passion is something that we don't want to give up, and it's something that keeps us saying no to God and keeps us from going in holiness. So we have to break from these if we truly want to be holy. Okay, so those are all the obstacles to the sacred heart. But how do we overcome these obstacles and gain a true devotion to the sacred heart of Jesus? The first is prayer. We have to pray every day, every day, with reverence, with devotion, with piety and attention. All prayer is, is simply a conversation with Christ, speaking to him, you know, asking him anything. Grant me this virtue. Help me overcome this fault. I find this person particularly difficult. Help me to love him. Help me to love her. All these are part of prayer. We can ask God for these things. Speak to him like a friend. Go into your room in silence where nobody will disturb you. Or come before our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. He's here. He's real and he's alive. And prayer makes us believe that. So we have to pray. Not just to convince us, but because he's real. He's waiting for us in prayer. He's waiting for us. Why do we leave him? Now, in mental prayer, we we develop an intimacy with Christ, and we develop that personal relationship with our Lord. This is what we need. We need prayer. But if mental prayer becomes difficult for us, or we become easily distracted, then read something before. Read something on the life of a saint, or maybe something on the passion or the life of Christ. And that way, when you do that, you have something to think about. Or you can have an image in front of you, a crucifix, the image of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, our Blessed Mother. These will all help you pray. When it comes to prayer, we also need to ask ourselves a few questions. Do we say the morning offering every morning? Are we saying our three Hail Marys in the morning and in the evening? for holiness and for purity? Are we saying our evening prayers? Are we saying the family rosary? If we're not doing these, we have to start doing them. That's just it. These are the basics. Now, these things are the basics to get us to heaven, to get us to have that prayer life. Now, when I go before God, he will ask me, where are your parishioners? Why didn't you teach them to pray? Why aren't they holy? Why aren't they saints? Of course, he's going to ask us the same thing. We all have to pray. We have to be holy. We have to become saints. It's easy to get to heaven. God is just looking for an excuse to get us there. And that excuse can be prayer. St. Alphonsus tells us that he who prays will be saved, and he who does not pray will not be saved. It's that simple. Now, the second way to strengthen us in the devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus is the frequent frequent and, and reverent Holy Communions. We have to be reverent. We have to be devout. St. Alphonsus tells us that one Holy Communion is sufficient for us to become saints. One Holy Communion, that's all. That makes us saints, or that can make us saints. So why aren't we saints? It's because we're not preparing ourselves properly for Holy Communion. William of Paris says that this failure to reap more abundant fruit from Holy Communion comes from especially or comes especially from the want of fervent preparation. Preparation involves not just a few minutes before Holy Communion. Preparation involves all of the exercises of the day. Spiritual reading, silence, meditation, manual labor, 
practicing virtue in our state of life, whether it's married, single, priest, religious. The preparation also involves arriving early before Mass. Coming early, kneeling down reverently, we set our intention for Mass, and then we begin to think about how much God loves us in the Blessed Sacrament, how he died for me, and who it is that I am about to receive. But we need to get to Mass early for this. We should also be doing a proper Thanksgiving afterwards, This unites us to our Lord. Now, of course, your vocations always come first, so it's difficult with the children. Well, God sees that, and God sees that you're making the efforts and the willful desire to do that. Well, you can offer even that up. I'm not able to make this proper preparation because I have to tend to my children. Well, God has given you those children. They're a gift. And so your preparation will be in taking care of those children, and you can offer that up as your preparation. Now, Holy Communion is such a beautiful thing. We have lost it with the lack of liturgy that we see out there, the lack of holiness and the lack of reverence. But it's not because of anything lacking in Holy Communion. It's something lacking in our understanding. So I'll read a part of the life of St. Teresa of the Child Jesus about the time that she received her first Holy Communion. St. Teresa says, The beautiful day of days finally arrived. The smallest detail of that heavenly day have left unspeakable memories in my soul. The joyous awakening at dawn. The respectful embraces of the teachers and our older companions. There are certain things that lose their perfume as soon as they're exposed to air, she says. There are deep spiritual thoughts which cannot be expressed in human language without losing their intimate and heavenly meaning. They are similar to the white stone that I will give give to him who conquers with the name written on the stone which no one knows except him who receives it. Ah, how sweet was that first kiss of Jesus. It was a kiss of love. I felt that I was loved, and I said, I love you. And I give myself to you forever. There were no demands made, no struggles, no sacrifices. For a long time now, Jesus and poor little Therese looked at and understood each other. That day it was no longer simply a look. It was a fusion. They were no longer two. Therese had vanished as a drop of water, is lost in the immensity of the ocean. And Jesus alone remained. He was the master, the king. She had a tremendous experience of First Holy Communion because she loved God so much and she'd been preparing herself for so long. But we can have these if we prepare ourselves with love of God. The third way to grow in devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, is by frequent visits to the Blessed Sacrament. Make them often. If we can't come to our Lord in the Holy Eucharist, then make a spiritual communion. You can do these at home, and it's very simple. Just put your own words to it, and the way you can do it is just saying something like, Lord, I cannot receive you sacramentally, but I ask that you enter into my soul spiritually. That's all. And then sit in quiet meditation as our Lord comes into your soul spiritually. The saints used to do this. St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi used to do this hundreds of times a day so that she would grow in holiness, and she had a great love for God, and this only fueled that love for Christ. The fourth way of growing in devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus is to make reparation to the Sacred Heart. Now, this is the whole point of the devotion, to make reparation. Now, what do I mean by that, making reparation? To make reparation... We're talking about repairing the damage due to sin. Not only the sin that we've committed, but the sins that others have committed. We make this reparation to a God who's already so deeply offended at the sins of this world. In fact, our Lord told St. Margaret Mary, He said, Behold this heart which has loved men so much and has been so little loved in return. Well, reparation helps us to return this love. 
this is something we should do for love of God. Now, making this reparation, it's sort of like a little kid who sees his father sad. He sees him sitting on the couch. Now he sees his dad suffering. And he may be worried about something, the child thinks to himself. Maybe it's a bill. Maybe it's something at work. The child doesn't know. But he sees that the dad is suffering something because he sees him sad. So the child goes up to him and he speaks to him. How you doing, dad? Is everything okay? You can talk to me about anything? Of course, this is something that's very pleasing to a father, to see a little child. Now, what can a child do? He can't pay the bills. He can't take care of anything at work. But the child is offering his love to the father. And this is something pleasing to the father. Now, we think of this on the natural level. It brings us joy. How much more... God the Father in heaven. How much more our Lord in his sacred heart if we give him this reparation? Now, when we make reparation to our Lord, we do something that pleases him, something like this little child. In fact, God told St. Margaret Mary how pleasing this devotion is to him by making reparation. And this is why he wants this devotion established of making reparation. So I'll show two ways in how we can make reparation. The first is through the nine first Fridays, and the second by acts of reparation. Now, the first Fridays, we can make reparation for our sins by going to Holy Communion on the first Friday of every month and offering this Holy Communion in reparation for our sins because we love God. Don't offer it for anything else. Just offer it to repair for all the sins that I've committed in my past life and also for sinners who have no one to make reparation for them. And this will be pleasing to our Lord. Now, why did our Lord choose Fridays for this day of reparation? It's because our Lord died on this day. And this devotion of First Fridays, of making reparation to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, is united with His passion because this is the day that He redeemed us. And so when we do this, we do something little to alleviate the sufferings of Christ. Now, the second form of reparation is simply by making small acts of reparation. What do I mean by that? Now, what I mean by acts of reparation is we do things to make up for our sins and the sins of others. For example, if I commit often sins of gossip or sins of detraction, which I know are offensive to God, and I have sorrow for them, that I can take the opportunity of when I suffer an injustice from someone or someone speaking bad about me, I can offer this up in silence as reparation for these sins and not attempt to defend myself. And we can offer it up to our Lord saying, I know what it's like to be falsely accused. And I unite this to make reparation for anyone who has betrayed you and for myself who have betrayed you many times by sin. And in that way you can make reparation for this. This is a small act. But it doesn't have to just include our sins. It can include the sins of others. Now, many of us think, well, I have so many sins to make reparation for. Why can't I just offer them for mine? Well, if we offer them up for somebody else, then we participate also in the sanctification of man, in the redemption of man. That's what our Lord did. When he died on Good Friday, he died for us. He didn't need it for himself. He died for us. And so when we make reparation for this, we're doing reparation for others. We're participating in this passion of Christ because we're offering reparation for sinners. Now, if we feel outraged at the filth of impurity, at the checkout stands or on billboards that we see, we can do something about it. We can go to the supermarket, ask the manager that we'd like a family aisle, show them your receipts. Now, I know sometimes, like, oh, it might be embarrassing, you know, what are people going to think about? Who cares? That's human respect. Offer that up in reparation for all the sins of pride. And that way you can make reparation for any passage of impurity by doing this type of reparation. And this way you're helping not only not only yourself, your family, but also others who would like a line the same way. But you can take this, and this is something that is of redemptive value against uh, sins of impurity. If we hear someone blaspheme, we can admonish him if possible, and then make reparation on our own, such as saying the divine praises. Blessed be God, blessed be his holy name. We can make the divine praises and and, uh, offer up reparation for this sin. We can also add some penance if we want. 
Now, all of this gives us a living awareness of the presence of God, and it helps us to think often of the passion of Christ because we're having some little participation in this life. Now, what it does is it takes our minds off of ourselves because we're constantly doing reparation for sins, And so all of a sudden we're thinking about Christ and our minds are off of ourselves. And so we start losing that idea of me. And we realize it's not all about me, it's all about God. That's what reparation helps us do. So it's an exercise, but it's an exercise in holiness. And the last way to grow in a true devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus is through tender devotion to our Blessed Mother. Now, this is very important because our Lord came into the world through Mary. The flesh of his heart is the same flesh as Mary's. So if we have devotion to our lady's heart, if we have a devotion to her, then we'll have a devotion to the sacred heart of Jesus because we'll perfectly honor him. Now, to have a true and tender devotion to our blessed mother, we have to, first of all, avoid all sin all mortal sins and deliberate venial sins, and we have to work on our imperfections. St. Joseph Cafaso says, Most of all, I urge you not to displease Our Lady. Now, there's only one thing that displeases her, and that's sin. If a good son or daughter knows that something causes his mother displeasure, he doesn't do it. For he reasons thus, I know that my mother does not look with favor on this. I know it offends her. I know it causes her displeasure. I know it disgusts her and therefore I will not do it. True devotion consists in imitating Mary's virtues. Pope Pius XII says, Do not forget that in order for devotion to Our Lady to be recognized as true and solid, and therefore productive of precious fruit and abundant grace, one must nourish it by imitating the life of her that he wants to honor. How do we do that? How do we learn about the virtues of Mary? Well, this is where spiritual reading on Our Lady is so important. It's vital. We can read on devotion to Our Lady by Father Stefano Minelli, the City of God by Mother Mary of Agrida, true devotion to Mary by St. Louis de Montfort. Bishop Sheen also writes a book called The World's First Love about our Blessed Mother. And also good books on true apparitions of Mary. Lourdes, Fatima, Guadalupe, Nock, not the false ones. Bayside, Medjugorje, any of those. But let's look at the true ones. We need to start with Fatima, because here we have a foundation for the devotion to Mary. These are for everyone, and they're not optional. Our Lady requested these, so we should treat it as a command. Remember, Mary never forces us but she knows absolutely what is best for us. She loves us. She's our mother. Our Lady of Fatima made these requests of us as a means of protection and salvation in these wicked times. She made these five following requests. She asked us to do penance and reparation for our own sins and the sins of others who don't pray for themselves. Now, we already spoke of reparation to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. We can do the same for the Immaculate Heart of Mary. But we should be doing some type of penance every day, learning how to say no to ourselves, but also for this intention. It can be something as simple as putting a pebble in our shoe, not putting salad dressing on our salad, spicing up our food, or maybe giving up coffee for a day, whatever, not putting sugar, cream in your coffee. You all know exactly what you like, and you can sacrifice that for one day in offering a reparation. Our Lady also asked us to pray uh, five decades of the rosary every day. And with this, she tied 15 promises that go with the rosary. And I'll read those off to you. Now, these are 15 promises. Our Lady promises she doesn't lie. She doesn't go back on any of her promises. She says, whoever shall faithfully serve me by the recitation of the rosary shall receive signal graces. I promise my special protection and the greatest graces to all those who shall recite the rosary. The rosary shall be a powerful armor against hell. It will destroy vice, decrease sin, and defeat heresies. I will cause virtue and good works to flourish. I will obtain for souls the abundant mercy of God. 
I will withdraw the hearts of men from the love of the world and its vanities. And I will lift them up to the desire of eternal things. She also said, The soul which recommends itself to me by recitation of the rosary shall not perish. Whoever shall have a true devotion for the rosary shall not die without the sacraments of the church. I shall deliver from purgatory those who have been devoted to the rosary. The faithful children of the rosary shall merit a high degree of glory in heaven. You shall obtain all that you ask of me by the recitation of the rosary. I have obtained from my divine Son that all the advocates of the rosary shall have intercessors in heaven, the entire celestial court, during their life and at the hour of their death. And devotion to my rosary is a great sign of predestination. There are many promises that go with the rosary. Our Lady doesn't lie. Then we have to do consecration to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Now, there are many helpful methods. St. Louis de Montfort, St. Maximilian Kolbe. Renew this consecration every morning. And all we need to do to renew it is just say something simple like, I am all thine, all that I have is thine. But it has to be interior. It has to come from the heart. We should wear the brown scapular. He who dies wearing the scapular will not suffer the eternal fires of hell. These are Our Lady's words to St. Simon Stock. This is a promise of Mary. Now, there is a story uh, that I, I've said to a few people. I don't, I'm, I don't know if I've mentioned in a sermon or not, but I'll say it again. But there was a story of, of a priest that I know, and he was, a, he was a chaplain during the Vietnam War, and he was telling me about the importance of the brown scapular. Now, he was, he was a, um, a Marine, a ground pounder in uh, World War II and in Korea. And then between the two wars, he became a priest and a chaplain in the military, in the Marine Corps. Now, he was out on an ambush. or Actually, he wasn't in the ambush. He was on a, uh, on a patrol, and his, uh, his platoon got ambushed. And one of the guys who got shot was Catholic, and he was lying uh, on the field. Of course, they were still taking fire, but he ran out there. And this man had been shot through the head with what's equivalent to a 50 caliber round. Now, if any of you know what a 50 caliber round is, shot through the head, there's no way. There's absolutely nothing left of a person's head. But he was still alive. He was still speaking. Now, Father McCoy went up to him, heard his confession, and the man died. Now, during this... Father McCoy reached down his shirt to take out the dog tags for identification. And with it, he pulled out a scapular. This is the promise of the scapular. Our Lady fulfills her promises. Now you might ask, well, Father, what if a man wants to die in his sins and he still wears his scapular? Well, St. Claude de la Colombière answers this question. He says, then you will die in your sins, but you will not die in your scapular. A man once tried to commit suicide by drowning himself, and he tried three, t- three different times, and he was rescued three different times. But he was determined to commit suicide. So he tore off his scapular, he jumped in the water, and he was successful. He died in his sins. Our Lady fulfills her promises, and God will not be mocked. We should also offer reparation on the five first Saturdays. And what that means is every first Saturday of the month, we should recite the rosary, meditate for 15 minutes on one or more of the mysteries of the rosary, go to confession within a week of that first Saturday, receive Holy Communion, all of these to make reparation to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And with this, we have the promise of final repentance. That is, if we fulfill this devotion of First Saturdays, we will not suffer the eternal fires of hell. St. Joseph Cafaso, the saint of the gallows, was talking about a man who was condemned. Now, he's called a saint of, saint of the gallows because he was a chaplain for prisoners. Now, there was one time this, com- this condemned man refused all the sacraments from every priest, no matter how hard they tried. Now, St. Joseph Cafaso was praying for this hardened sinner because he was refusing the sacraments. And as he was on his way to the gallows to be killed, to be executed, St. Joseph was praying for him. But he saw the prisoner bow his head to Our Lady. And when he saw this, 
He cried out, He is saved. He is saved. Our Lady will save him. And so right away, St. Joseph ran up to the gallows, and the man said, Father, I want to go to confession. And he made a good confession before he died. All because he bowed his head to an image of Mary. God loves us. He wants us to love him. He wants to come to life in us. He wants to see his image in us. The more perfectly he sees himself in us, the more pleasing we are to God. In the devotion to the sacred heart, we are in a sense making our hearts his. We become more pleasing to God. In the devotion to the sacred heart, we are showing the same love that Jesus Christ has for sinners in his passion. So it makes us more like him. Mary gave birth to our Lord, and she gave flesh to his sacred heart. Devotion to Our Lady is inseparable from devotion to the sacred heart of Jesus. Mary's love for Jesus is perfect, and she will perfect our love for him. Our Lord Jesus Christ would not have come into this world without Mary as his mother, and she will, we will never be able to give life to Christ perfectly in our souls without Mary. Now, what does the heart of Jesus deserve? What does the Immaculate Heart of Mary deserve from such goodness? What does the Sacred Heart of Jesus receive from men? He receives little satisfaction from us. There are so few that are grateful to Him and truly love Him. So few who are willing to speak to Him and to visit Him. So few who follow Him and allow Him to rule over us. Who return to Him coldness indifference and irreverence even against the sacrament of his love in the Holy Eucharist. We return sacrilege and profanation by receiving our Lord in mortal sin. Many have seen how God is offended by this, but so few are willing to love him. Our Lord finds many friends who want to partake of his banquet, but so few friends of his cross. Now, I'm sure you've all heard the words of St. Ignatius, but they're powerful and worth repeating again. Christ died for me. What have I done for him? What am I doing for him? What will I do for him? These words, these following words, must be engraved on our minds, on our souls, and in our hearts. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart, with thy whole soul, and with thy whole strength. Let us close with the Hail Mary, and I'll give you all my blessing afterwards. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Most sacred heart of Jesus, Immaculate Heart of Mary, St. Alphonsus, St. Thomas, St. John of the Cross. Pax et benedictio de omnipotentis, Patris et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti, descendat super vos, et maniat semper. Amen.